Hello. Hi, I'm Federico. Um, sorry, I'll keep an eye on the time because I know we're really tight. Okay. Okay, so um, I was asked to speak um, about cosmology, and I will ad uh, address the, the problem of cosmology from a bit of a lateral angle. And uh, I'm not going to say something, let's say, ultimate and decisive, or more tracing um, a, a possible line of inquiry, which might be, might be helpful also to think about cultural production today. So my, my focus will be on cultural production, on the question of technology in part, as you will see, and especially on what happens after the collapse of a civilization. So I'll start with a little anecdote, as you do, um, which dates back to when I was living in Milan, first year of university, I was studying economics, God knows why. And um, I remember I, was, uh, I found myself in the wrong place at the wrong time, basically. So I tried to escape the situation by completely entering a state of denial, not going to classes, not doing assignments, not in any way engaging with it, pretending that it never happened. And I remember my father one day coming back home, finding me asleep in the afternoon as usual, and telling me, you have a great future behind you. And that, which by the way is a quote from Joyce's Ulysses, but I didn't know at the time. But, um, <clears throat> and that uh, stuck with me somehow, having a great future behind, because I remember also feeling clearly before falling asleep again, um, the question, if I have a great future behind, in what time am I living now, okay? The possibility of living in a time after the end of the future, at that moment kind of struck me as a possibility, but then I developed it more and more as, a, as an idea. And I think to a certain extent is an idea that we have to confront today, especially as cultural producers. Um, it is possible to live after the end of a future. Why? Well, it depends on, uh, on that strange thing, which is time. Of course, time doesn't exist. We know it, we've known it for since time immemorial, so to say, since the Parmenideans. It's been proven uh, beyond doubt, let's say logically, by MacTaggart at the beginning of the 20th century. Quantum physics gives us more and more demonstrations that time doesn't exist, and yet time is a presence that we have to, um, to face constantly. It's somehow a presence that is within everything that we do. Yes, of course, you might reply with Kant that is to do with our categories of the way in which we uh, perceive the world. Or you could also reply with Aristotle that time is just a way of counting change according to number. But I think there is another element here. And to get that element about time and thus about futures and the end of the future, we need to get back to worlds. When we look around ourselves, we, we don't see a world immediately. We have a raw avalanche of perceptions. And we systematize these perceptions in a certain way. We, we cut things. For example, we cut this bottle out of a table. There is no such thing as a bottle in itself, but we cut it out so that we are able to interact with it. By doing this, we create a world. We create the world, the cosmos, the mundus, the thing that is beautiful and ordered because we have separated it. The way we do it is through separation, as I said, which means through language. By assigning names to things, by cutting linguistically the particles of the world by creating a landscape around us, which is a linguistic landscape, we create a world. So time is a rhythm of this narration that is the world. The world itself is a narration. It's not a thing that we encounter. We encounter raw reality, but we narrate a world out of it. This world is a rhythm. That rhythm is time. Every narration as a story has an end, has a beginning, and has an end. So Aristotle was right. Time is counting of, counting of change according to number. The question is, depends on who's counting and how. In that case, when I had a future behind myself, my father was correct. I mean, it was wrong about the possibility of it being a great future, but it was right about it being a future that finished. A certain story about myself um, had ended, and together with it had ended the time segment that came with it. And I think here it's important to keep this in mind. We're used to talk about timelines, but I'm not sure about that. Because a timeline, geometrically, is a, is a line that has infinite extension, also no beginning and no end. And unfortunately, that's not how narrations go. Maybe stories go on forever, but narrations start and end with the voice that narrates them. So it's a time segment 
that we're talking about. Time is made of segments, not of lines. And every segment has its own temporality, its own past, present, and future. When the story ends, when that story about the world ends, let's say when the form of worlding, of making out the world, of narrating a world out of things ends, so that timeline ends, that future ends. This was true when I was 18. And um, of course, we have witnessed this already. The passage between childhood and, um, and adulthood is a moment in which worlds end and time, time segments end. But it's equally true of different persons, big persons in a sense, civilizations. Civilizations operate in a similar way as people. A civilization, to fight, a civilization simply means a general narrations, a narration which we adopt collectively, not necessarily because we believe in it so much privately, but because we use it as the, as the groundwork to, to operate exchanges. Okay? So we collectively agree that reality is made up of certain things, that these things truly exist more or less, that time unfolds in a certain way, and so on and so forth. Now, the question is um, that sometimes also civilizations come to an end. Sometimes particular forms of worlding come to an end. This is something that we've known since time immemorial, once again. Maybe it's not so present in, in a city as Dubai, in which um, the new is so incredibly prominent. But in other parts, for example, of the Mediterranean basin, it's very clear to see. If you walk through Athens or through Palermo, you have a clear understanding of how many worlds take place one after the other, how the apocalypse is, is not a rare event as Americans often believe. And, um, and you also understand that temporality works in that same way. So at the moment, there seems to be a, a big concern about what to do with our future. I think if we take this kind of perspective about the temporality of things and the destiny of civilizations and as narrative machines, we might want to into, put into perspective the question of what to do with our future. There are clear signs that the, that particular story, that particular world, which enjoyed hegemonic status for a long time, what we can call uh, westernized modernity. I use westernized rather than western because it's not geographically specific to the west. It's a modus operandi. Westernized modernity as a story might well be coming to an end. And I think the anxieties that come together with the ecological catastrophe although, of course, grounded in data, but also signals to the self-awareness of people living within that world that that world is coming to an end. This anxiety does suggest that we shouldn't look so much into what to do with our future, because the future doesn't exist. The future is the time of a certain narration. If we are living in a moment in which a certain narration is coming to an end, that future, the future is coming to an end. So the question becomes, what to do with what happens after the end of the future. Now, of course, one could ask, but why? Why should we care? Why should we care at all about being concerned about what happens after the end of this future? And I think to a certain extent we have to. It is a little bit of a categorical imperative. Um, it's not an ethical imperative in any way, but it's an aesthetic imperative. Why? Let's go back one second. There is no such thing as the world. The world is a narration that we insert on top of a raw avalanche of reality. This act of inserting an order, a cosmos, is not an ethical act. It's not a logical act. It's an aesthetic act. It's axiomatic, like Euclid at the beginning of these, these geometrical elements. I'll give you these axioms. They are based not on the system, but they give rise to a system. This is an aesthetic act. So we are endowed with the world thanks to aesthetics, fundamentally. But aesthetics, like any system, has its own requirements. And the requirement of aesthetic is the imperative of aesthetic, which is basically one. Like any system, aesthetic wishes its own perpetuation. This is the, the conatus, as Spinoza would say, of, any, of anything, including systems. And aesthetics demands only one thing, that any aesthetic act allows for another aesthetic act to take place, to take place afterwards. This particular aesthetic demand is the price that we have to pay in order to have a world. And unfortunately, we need to have a world. Uh, we are unable to live without a world, even though it's fake to a certain extent. <clears throat> this demand is 
is something that you can face differently in different moments of a narrative cycle, so to say. If you are in the middle of the book, if you are writing halfway through uh, an, a, certain, a, a certain history, um, then you can satisfy this aesthetical imperative to allow for new aesthetic acts to take place after yours to take place in the future. So you, you work for, uh, in order to unleash endless possibilities in the future. However, if you're living in a different time of the story, and by the way, it's just the same. Living within, living in the middle of the book or at the end of the book is just the same. It's a, as worthy an experience. It's not in any way a diminished or a sorry state. It simply is a different moment within the narration. But the aesthetic demand is slightly different. You cannot allow for new aesthetic acts to take place in the future because the future is running out, because the future is an element of the story, of course, and that story is ending. But so you have to learn how to allow for new aesthetic acts after the end of the future. To say it with terms that would be more typical of Hellenistic philosophy, if in the first case, your imperative is to learn how to live well. In the second case, your imperative is to learn how to die well. One second. Have a sip of water. <clears throat> so, it is my conviction that in the current moment, anybody who perceives themselves as somehow belonging to that civilization of the, or that civilization it means a world, okay? As a world endowed with a social body. Or that civilization of westernized modernity finds themselves to operate um, as somebody who has to learn how to die well, which is also something we, as um, that westernized culture hasn't really kind of engaged with for a very long time. It is a difficult question for us today, and even more so than in the past. Why? Well, because the question remains, the question is, what does remain of us? Hmm? What are we leaving behind ourselves that it somehow allows for a new aesthetic act afterwards? Not just allows for, but helps, aids. Let's say the quality of what we do is measured by, the, by how much we contribute and we help new aesthetic acts after the end of ours the creation of new worlds after ours, our own erasure to a certain extent. <clears throat> the first problem that we encounter, we encounter basically two problems which are very severe for the contemporary civilization I'm discussing. The first is technology. Technology is a big problem. It's a big problem because usually when a civilization loses its body, for example, when the Mycenaeans disappeared in 1200 BC, or when the Western Roman Empire ended in the fifth century, Immediately after, technology is the first to, to collapse. The Mycenaeans in 1200 BC had bronze working, long distance seafaring, and especially an alphabet. Writing was lost for 500 years in Greece after that, in the so-called Hellenic Middle Ages, including bronze working and seafaring. The Roman Empire had an incredible network of infrastructures that became immediately useless. This is a short poem by one of the early Anglo-Saxon poets about the stones of the giants. He was walking through the Roman ruins of Bath in England and he thought only the giants could have built this, which were thermal baths. So technology is the first thing that disappears when a civilization loses its body. But in our case, it's even more severe. It's even more severe for two reasons, because <clears throat> in our case, we are we are giving the nigh entirety of our cultural production, hmm? so basically what remains of us to a certain extent, to tell our story and to somehow contribute to create ruins from which others in the future will be able to, to take some material. We are consigning the nigh entirety of our cultural legacies to di digital means. <clears throat> and digital means are incredibly fragile. It is very easy to see, but let me uh, point out again why. They rely on an incredibly complex, heavily distributed network of economic resources in order to, to function. The machines just, in order to be built and to be maintained, the hardware requires an incredibly sophisticated global network, which is operative on a, on a planetary scale. Not only that, but all the materials in order to be accessed require machines that work and require electricity that works. You see, it's not like just opening a book or looking at an obelisk. You require an entire economic system to access the information. 
but of course, when the civilization collapses, the economic system is, is what collapses. So the information becomes impossible to retrieve. And not just the digital information, also the non-digital information. Um, I work as a publisher, and, um, and we all know that the paper we publish things will not be anywhere to be found in a few hundred years. It will not be anywhere to be found for sure by the time that a new civilization will have archaeologists. New civilizations don't usually engage in archaeology as much at the beginning. But by the time they might have the fantasy of creating archaeologists, there will be nothing to find. Nothing to find, also nothing to find probably in terms of um, very little to say, to find in terms of architecture. After decades of relentless capitalism, the quality of the materials has been degraded so much that in a few hundred years, what you'll find also in enormous buildings of uh, glass and steel will be just areas that are uninhabitable by the amount of shards that are just disseminated on the ground. So what will remain of us? Pollution and the marks that we leave on the cultural environment, on, on the, on the, that we leave on the natural environment, okay? So we already see at this point that there is a problem with the imperative, the aesthetic imperative of learning how to die well. We have that problem environmentally, but we have that problem culturally. We're leaving nothing behind. Literally nothing except the degradation that we've caused. That, that is one way to fail, okay? The problem here is, is also that it's not just the technology, but it's also the content of what we might leave. What kind of content, what kind of culture might be helpful to those who will come after us? Um, of course, there is no way of knowing in any way what they might need. But there is a way to imagine what kind of subjectivity might emerge after the end of a civilization. How do we know? Because this happened many times before. Usually when you, when you find the definition early or archaic, that means somebody that lives towards the beginning of a, of a world building narration. It simply means that. Um, here, of course, Mircea Eliade says something different about primitives, but we're not going to that dispute. Um, so what kind of, what, what do archaic people look for? Um, we can answer historically, and also we can answer experientially. Why? Because we have been archaics ourselves a few times, and one time in particular. Of course, when we are children, we're not archaic as much, because we are not between the end of a narration and the beginning of a new one. We are just at the beginning of a new one. But after the end of childhood, before so-called adulthood begins, you have a moment in which you locate yourself exactly in the same position as the archaic people. At the end of a world of childhood whose infrastructures have collapsed, whose frame of sense has collapsed, whose temporality has collapsed. And you find this scavenge through the ruins and you find only bits that somehow help you to rebuild a different world. In English, it's called teenage. In Latin, adolescenza, or in, Latin, or in Italian, or archaic. When we usually think about other civilizations, we tend to associate them to the role of children the primitives, or adults, the aliens. But in fact, if we are thinking today as cultural producers, what would remain of us and how it might be of service to those who will come after the end of this future, which is after the end of the future, I think it would be more useful to imagine that we are discussing not with children or with adults, but with adolescents. And adolescents have a specific subjectivity. Every adolescent is different, of course, but they tend to have a specific subjectivity. Also, incidentally, by the way, whenever we encounter all the civilizations that have spoken like us, whatever has remained of all the civilizations has always been geared to adolescence. Think of the heroes of the Iliad. The Mycenaean world ended 500 years of gap, and then classical Greece restarted with the Iliad and the Odyssey, which were about the Mycenaeans. And all the protagonists are teenagers. Hmm? Gilgamesh. All these characters, usually the hero of the fables, is always an adolescent. The adolescent is the subjectivity of the archaic people, and the archaic is the subjectivity of the adolescent. Um, so we don't know what they are like exactly, but we know what kind of subjectivity they have. And it is characterized by one strange, uncomfortable position. 
Let's continue with distinct children, adults, and adolescents. I'm using them almost as mythological figures, and you will see also why. But um, <clears throat> we could say that the, the tendency of, of a child is that of being afraid primarily of disorder and being attracted towards order, creating somehow within this avalanche something that keeps things in check. That's why, for example, you have sometimes the, 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 the beginning of OCD usually is a, is, comes with childhood. Hmm? The subjectivity of the adult is, of course, the opposite. The fear is of order rather than disorder. The fear of being destroyed by the world that you've built, of being smothered and swallowed. And the attempt is that of breaking and destroying somehow, of reinserting order. The adolescent is in an uncomfortable position because they are pressed from both sides by, let's say, the, the demons of order and disorder. And this is the paradox of freedom, of course. When you find yourself in that position in which you can enact freedom, but simultaneously, the moment you enact it, you lose it. You are caged by your decisions. And the moment you don't enact it, you are swallowed by the abyss. Okay? It's an impossible position to find yourself in. That is the position of the archaic. And this is also, to a certain extent, and this is a kind of suggestion of literary criticism, if you like, this is also, I believe, an interesting way to read mythological texts, which are usually produced exactly to, um, to cater for that particular form of subjectivity. So if we, I'm keeping an eye on the time uh, to see, yeah? OK. Um, <clears throat> so if we wish to um, gear our cultural production towards um, the people that we come after the end of our future, I think we need to keep in mind what kind of people they will be and what kind of things they will need. Basically, what they will need somehow, or more exactly, what they will look for by well, scavenging through our ruins. And as I said, not with the love of the archivist or of the archaeologist, but with somebody that, that loots and pillages, with the same way in which you looked at your childhood when you were 15, okay? with that kind of relationship of unfaithfulness also and of pure use. They will look for a pharmacon. As in something which is at the same time a medicine and a poison, okay? Something that is capable of counteracting certain forces and of allowing others. In what way does our contemporary culture um, contribute to this? Mm. Well, the first thing to say is that it doesn't matter because none of it is going to remain, which is a wonderful feeling, of course. We are given a second chance. We're given a second chance to somehow pretend that none of what we've done ever really existed, and a second chance to pretend that we actually did something else, something entirely different, that we did, in fact, invent this wonderful pharmacon, that we invented a form of creation of the world, a form of worlding, of making the world emerge, which really produces this. <clears throat> to a certain extent, the fragility of our digital infrastructure is a blessing. It gives us a second chance. It's fake, and it's a lie but it's a lie for good reason. I think there is a point in kind of seizing that line rather than remaining truthful and faithful to our actual narration, which in no way produces a pharmacon, in no way deals with order and disorder in the same, with even hands, in no way resolves the problem of fear in, in a form that en enhances freedom. On the contrary, of course, it is a triumph of order, but of paranoid order, of an order without a subject, of an order in the sense of an injunction, an injunction that repeats itself. It's a super egoical a structure devoid even of the, of the sound of the super egoical voice. Um, we were talking about it this morning, about the super egoical voice to a certain extent. So we have, we're given a second chance. And um, I think that in order to kind of face this second possibility, of lying basically about ourselves, but for good reason, um, we should try to look for everything that we have available. A little bit is ours, a little bit is what remains from the ruins of other times. And we have to probably look at these things and combine them together. A pharmacon is a, you know, is a pharmaceutical, is a medicine. And you know, like in ancient times, you would take different herbs, grind them, and combine them. Each one of them is uh, insufficient to tackle the illness, let's say, but all together they work. And there are three plants within the kind of universal garden of the present from which we can take something. One of them is, let's say, flourishing in its, our typical plant, and uh, two are, one is almost entirely eradicated, 
and the other one, by definition, doesn't exist. I'm talking about three figures of imagination, three ways of worlding that we can put together to create a narration. The metaphysician, the shaman, and the mystic. A metaphysician is us. A metaphysician is this. The metaphysician is science, anthropology, natural sciences, is classification, basically. Is that form of creating a world that imposes language first and language as constructed by the law of non-contradiction. A metaphysician says that to any given question, the answer is either this or that, either one or zero. You cannot be at the same time A and non-A. So this is a form of ordering, creating the world through a system of organization. <clears throat> and a world that is made of discontinuities, of separate individual units, each of which replies in a definitive way to a certain question. The shaman is another form of worlding. We have memories of it. We have memories in literature mainly. And we have a little bit of memories in the unfortunate populations that live compressed as refugees in their own home in the Amazon forest. And we know that the, the form of worlding of the shaman is different. To the question, what is this? The, the shaman replies, it is this and that. Hmm? The metaphysician says, is this this or that? The shaman says, it is this and that. There is a notion in shamanism, which is called multi multinaturalism, discussed by Eduardo Viveros de Castro, which presents the shaman as an agent of a world as a continuum, seen as a continuum of forces. And I'm sure Ariane Conti will, 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 will speak much more broad, uh, widely about this. <laughs> um, the shaman sees this continuum, hmm? the world as a continuum, and themselves as an agent that is at the same time traversed by the world and that allows and, or, and manages the movement of the world. The shaman is a figure of the world, but it's at the threshold between this movement and something outside the world. The metaphysician doesn't have that. The metaphysician is entirely within their system. It's an obsessional figure, the metaphysician. The shaman is a more liminal figure, has an awareness of what's beyond, and yet is faithful to the creation of the world. And finally, the mystic. The mystic by definition doesn't exist. The mystic, by definition, is esoteric, in, also in their ontology. They are in hiding. And the mystic, to the, to the question, what is this? They would reply, this is neither this nor that. If you ask a mystic, are you male or female? Their answer is neither. Hmm? The shaman would say both. The metaphysician would say one. Okay? The mystic has this absolute negation of the world. And... Um, <clears throat> If the shaman organizes the world as a form of negotiation, the mystic organizes the world as a, as a form of memory. The mystic is neither in the world nor outside of the world. Remember somehow what's outside, the raw reality, and remember somehow what's the world. But it's foreign to both. Hmm? The figure of the, of the mystic is a, is, a, is a figure of foreignness. So I think very differently from what we know, um, which, to be honest, has very, very little value to the reconstruction of, of a world from, from the ruins and especially from the devastated ruins that we will leave behind, which are not the ruins of the Roman Empire. These are different ruins. These are like, it's an environmental devastation that is at the level of certain societies in Central America um, back in the days. <clears throat> this combination of the three pharmaca that we might be able to put together might give something. But the question remains once again, with what means? With what media? If the digital media don't suffice, if the architectural media crumble, how? Even if we were to lie, even if we were to, for the dignity of our own sake, you know, to, to attempt to somehow to salvage our aesthetic dignity, which is salvage our own worlding, and for the good of those who will come after us, the aliens from a new time, how are we gonna pass it if the media will not work? Let's look again historically. The way usually culture passes, the way usually culture passes through the collapse of a civilization, that is through the end of time, once again, end times happen frequently, yeah? through end times usually <clears throat> is not through cultural means in the way we understand it, not as archives as much. Later on, they are salvaged as archives. By the time Roman culture was being salvaged as archives by the monks, for example, Roman culture has already survived. What had survived had already survived. 
and likewise in, uh, with the great libraries of, uh, of Greece. And how did it survive? It survived embodied within practices. The embodiment is particularly clear in the case of Mycenaean world. The Mycenaean world survived within the story of the Rhapsodes and Iodois, <clears throat> who used to embody them in their own memory. But more clearly, it survived as an ethical standard, okay? as, a, as an embodied practice to deal with the question of how do I risk my life? Okay? This is the point. How do I deal with ananke, with necessity, with the crushing force that I cannot avoid? This is the Iliad, basically. But the, other, the other way to look at it is what survived of the ancient Egyptian civilization. Not when Champollion found in the 19th century, but, but much earlier, when Alexander the Great arrived. When Alexander the Great arrived, the Egyptian civilization had already been destroyed physically, historically, it was dead. It was occupied by the Persians already by two, uh, 250 years. And yet, when Alexander the Great arrived, and after that event, when Hellenism arrived, which means when the Egyptian world came back with a vengeance from its ruins, it was already embodied only in magical practices, especially funerary practices. Once again, it's an embodiment within the frame of sense that deals with liminal situations. In that case, how do I deal with disappearing? How do I deal with the invisible and with disappearance? The same happened once again to the Roman world. Disappeared completely and then, 400 years after the Western Roman Empire had finished, on, on the Christmas day of the year 800, Charlemagne went into the cathedral and asked to be crowned Roman Emperor, which is absurd if you think about it. You have to be crowned Emperor of a world that had already vanished 400 years earlier. But why? Because once again, Rome had survived as an implicit internal narration of how do I deal with power? That faceless, <laughs> that faceless entity that I confront and that sometimes, if I am Charlemagne, I am. Now, you see, the way in which culture usually survives is as embodied within practices that have to do with liminal elements of life. Here, I think, cultural workers today have that opportunity of lying about us, um, and lying for a good reason, of creating a different type of narration that might survive as embodied within practices. It is already happening to a certain extent. It is happening already a little bit in the different narrations that we have about the environment. And it is happening a little bit also in, in terms of what we're talking about when we talk about post-humanism and transhumanism a little bit. But sometimes, with few, okay, with few exceptions, it remains an academic debate. As fellow cultural producers, I invite you to keep in mind that none of it will remain. The only thing that somehow, maybe, will be able to speak on our behalf and redeem, at least in part, you know, what we've done, is what remains embodied in cultural practices that have to do with liminal situations. And this is basically the one bet where we're putting at stake the past few hundred years and everything we've done until then. Thank you. I'm actually going to read uh, my paper. I hope it's not too academic for all of you. Uh, <laughs> Um, and I do need to make sure that you understand one concept before I begin, because I'm basing my talk on a similar time frame, which is an end. Uh, and I'm calling this new period that we find ourselves in the Anthropocene. This is a scientific term, and I want to make sure you all understand it. The Anthropocene is actually a term that comes out of geology. There are ge geological periods that the Earth goes through, and we have ended what was called the Holocene, which is the last 12,000 years that was typified by stability. So geological stability, which allowed the human species to flourish. That era of the Holocene is over. And the geologists have claimed that we've entered a new geological period called the Anthropocene, Anthropos, human, era, uh, precisely because we have affected every single aspect of the atmosphere, geosphere, etc. Yeah, so if you study a mosquito, it's DEET resistant. In other words, there is human culture in the mosquito. If you look up and make a prayer to the heavens, there is an ozone hole in the heavens. There's human culture there too. There's human culture everywhere, which is why we call this new geological period the Anthropocene. So my paper takes for granted that you understand the meaning of this term Anthropocene. <clears throat> In a play on Bruno Latour's famously destabilizing claim that we have never been modern, 
Professor of Religious Studies, Graham Harvey, has re recently added, but perhaps we have always been animists. Indeed, these two comments are more closely linked than one might at first infer. It was the anthropology of non-Western cultures that inspired Latour's intellectual journey and his famous claim, since it is precisely this discipline that treats the empirical, the social, and the linguistic as a continuous whole. It's through study and comparative anthropology that Latour was able to understand the nature of technology and undermine the dualities of subject and object, culture and nature, natural science and social science showing how pre-modern cultures had no trouble attributing agency to objects, subjects, spirits, and tools, helped Latour to separate agency from its supposed cause in a uniquely human interiority characterized by intentionality and purposive action, and thus to look more objectively at the forms of agency at work in the world. It's time, Latour famously pointed out in his book, We Have Never Been Modern, to see ourselves the way we are able to see the natives of non-modern cultures and to send ethnologists to study the modern tribe of scientific researchers. The ethnologist would notice that his modern informants adamantly refuse to see their projections onto nature and would conclude that, and I quote, for social reasons, Western scientists require a dualist attitude, end quote. This dualist attitude, intrinsic to Western science, can be traced back to Western humanism and its attempts to view human nature as exceptional and somehow extrinsic to the rest of nature. The supremacy of reason as the essential characteristic of human nature was thought to radically separate humans from an inferior, passive nature that could be exploited. In order to retain this separation, reason was disengaged from emotion, from embodiment, from intuition, and other traits associated with and other traits associated with inferior nature. Thus, the body and nature had to be subjugated and subdued, and their agency erased, in order to reinforce the dualistic constructions of mind and body, nature and culture. It's important to remember that this nature-culture divide is the last in a long line of divisions based upon the same logic of radical exclusion. Because the status of human exceptionalism was defined in terms of reason, which was the exclusive property of a Western male elite, many human others were deemed lacking in reason and thus part of exploitable nature. In her book, Environmental Culture, The Ecological Crisis of Reason, Environmental philosopher Val Plumwood traces a continuous line between such remoteness from nature and a similar remoteness that male elites established between themselves and women, slaves, and colonized others. Promoted by what she calls sadodispassionate science, such remoteness was used by science as an ideology of disengagement to wall itself off from ethics just as effectively as capitalism has done through the ideology of the private sphere. She writes, and I quote, the quote is here, many regimes and many oppressions have since lent their color to this hegemonic imaginary of reason and nature. In patriarchal thought, men represent reason and rightfully control the world, as well as the dangerous emotionality, irrationality, and reproductivity of women who are closer to nature. In the colonizing, racial, supremacist version, it is inferior and barbarian others who are closer to nature. An earlier and more primitive stage of our own rational civilization who receive only benefits when more advanced masters of reason, the colonizers, come to take away their land and put it to proper rational use. In the story of the coldly scientific hero of reason, knowledge is tortured from a passive, inert, and feminized nature in order to establish the empire of man over mere things and realize human salvation as victors of a subjugated and rationalized earth." End quote. It thus becomes impossible to separate anthropocentrism from other problematic centrisms, such as androcentrism, ethnocentrism, and eurocentrism. <laughs> 
All of these centrisms use a binary structure to exclude human and non-human others by isolating values in the realm of human reason alone, defined by those in power to justify domination. If such a model was useful for the Western conquest of the world and its expropriation of peoples and resources, in the age of the Anthropocene, it is revealing itself to be nothing less than suicidal. But if we have always been animists, then such a disengagement is merely a projection, a reification. Latour's A modernism thus represents a return of the repressed, since we're now forced to acknowledge the many agencies that were pushed below the surface to constitute what he calls the unconscious of the moderns. Such a return of the repressed could very well represent the Anthropocene as a new paradigm and inspire a relational ontology to replace Cartesian substance dualism <clears throat> with the solidarity that we need to find a solution to the climate crisis. If the Anthropocene has made clear the unsustainability of a system that is dependent on the nature-culture divide, an animistic relational ontology can provide an ontological foundation for valuing the non-human earth and averting the theft of planetary life and our and our children's futures. According to Kate Wright, the repression of animism apparent in modern dualistic thinking represents a major pathology. An animistic renaissance could thus function as an alternative to and a cure for the divisions and dichotomies founded in the human exceptionalism at the core of modern values. It constitutes what Wright calls an attempt to address uh, yes, an attempt to address the systematic pathology of a species disconnected from the conditions of its world. Becoming with offers a metaphysics grounded in connection, challenging delusions of separation, the erroneous belief that it is somehow possible to exempt ourselves from Earth's ecological community, end quote. Similarly, Gisli Palson calls the modern treatment of animistic cultures environmental orientalism in order to highlight the role the concept of nature plays in colonial hegemony. Equated with nature, animistic peoples were considered subhuman since they assigned social roles to the non-human world. Along the arrow of progress, such primitive peoples could be subjugated and expropriated just as natural resources were, or else educated to recognize the separation of nature from culture and thereby enter the domain of humanity proper. Anselme Franck, explains how animism functioned for modernity as what he calls a negative mirror image in order to construct its identity over and against an identity it could relegate to the primitive past. He writes, and I quote, unlike animists, moderns have replaced mere subjective belief with objective knowledge, and they have established the distinction proper between imagination and reality, mind and matter, self and world. Becoming modern meant to extirpate oneself from the world of animism, in which all those fundamental divides appear as inextricably fused. And by that very same gesture, they withdrew from those actually existing non-modern societies deemed animist the status of being fully human and fully real. By inscribing them into the continuity of objectifiable, mobilizable, and in the last instance, killable nature, and declaring their reality as merely illusionary. Colonial subjugation and extinction are inextricably linked to that silent death sentence." End quote. Because the ceaseless accumulation of commodity production that produced what sociologist Jason Moore calls cheap nature relies on appropriating the unpaid labor of women, nature, and colonies, moderns have revoked personhood from all those whom it has expropriated. However efficacious the illusory dualities of modernity have been in allowing moderns to appropriate resources for free and commodify unpaid life activity, Moore has shown that if the, and I quote, the great secret and the great accomplishment of capitalist civilization has been to not pay its bills, in the Anthropocene age, the bill has come due and we have reached the end of capitalism's free ride. End quote. If the particularly Western modern interpretation of progress measured in terms of infinite market growth is no longer credible due to the growing negative values of climate change and pollution, 
then it's time to rethink this duality between nature and culture and to replace it with an understanding of co-evolved relations that do not depend upon a dichotomy that extirpates all non-utilitarian value from the non-human world. The irony of such a project of revaluation has not been lost on anthropologist Alf Hornborg when he asks, and I quote, how shall we be able to reintroduce morality into our dealings with our non-human environment now that we have invested centuries of training and discourse into convincing ourselves that nature lies beyond the reach of moral concern? End quote. Indeed, as philosophers Adorno and Horkheimer put it in their book Dialectics of Enlightenment, such a valueless and commodified nature has entailed the disenchantment of the world since, and I quote, the disenchantment of the world means the extirpation of animism, end quote. If the separation between nature and culture is at the root of this disenchantment, then showing the illusory nature of this divide should in and of itself open the way for a transvaluation of values capable of redefining a relational ontology that attributes agency to all ecosystem participants and that is capable of re-enchanting the world. Might such a re-enchantment entail a return to pre-modern ways of thinking? If the West has always denied reciprocity and kinship with the natural world, perhaps indigenous populations who have always adhered to reciprocal relationality can inspire a monistic ontology not founded in human exceptionalism. Replacing the asymmetrical relation between nature and culture currently in place with a symmetrical one will require enlarging the scope of our values and thus of culture to the entire biosphere. And it will also require understanding the human species as an interdependent part of evolutionary natural processes. If modern duality has thus become implausible, it's time we sought to understand animism, both anthropologically, in terms of the dominant way of life of indigenous peoples, and philosophically, in terms of a new conceptual paradigm for the Anthropocene age. Part one, indigenous animism. Graham Harvey defines animism as the belief, and I quote, that the world is full of persons, only some of whom are human, and that life is always lived in relationship to others, end quote. As a conceptual system, animism entails four interrelated ideas, personhood, relationality, location, and ontological boundary crossing. According to the first characteristic, Agency is redistributed from the exclusively human domain to the entire biosphere. Bears and koalas, ants and nematodes all have their own complex cultures because nature is culture all the way down. Recognizing personhood in non-human others entails understanding such persons as conscious agents capable of intentional and intelligent communication. Recognizing a person thus requires a form of phenomenological perception that could be compared to Husserl's époque, a presence to the outmost vividness of the being before one that may require leaving behind the typificatory schemes that draw one into abstract dimensions linked to past and future projection. Learning to recognize persons can thus cultivate an appreciation for the way they reveal themselves to us, but can also according to anthropologists Danny Neve and Bird David Nurit, and I quote, counteract the current destructive tendency to understand and engage with things and persons according to a utilitarian understanding, end quote. For animists, such persons are defined relationally, our second trait, because they share their world with many other persons with whom they enter into complex forms of communication. Such a relational ontology entails that communication is always what Lévi Brühl called participation. In a polis, understood in a participatory framework, persons can never be understood in isolation and language is always dialogic. Because personhood is not understood in terms of ontological intrinsic essences, such relationality is essential for the constitution of a person. Persons exist through their relations because they are de dependent upon a shared ecosystem or location, our third characteristic, that grounds and gives meaning to their communication. So all persons are relational and all relations are situated and the location determines the communication and thus the persons that depend upon it. Harvey explains how these concepts work together as follows. Animists' contributions to ecological thinking and acting are rooted in the firm insistence that not only is all life 
capably located and related, but also that the attempt to escape is at the root of much, of much that is wrong with the world today. Animism's alternative promise is a celebratory engagement of embodied persons with a personal and sensuous world." End quote. Finally, the ability to cross ontological boundaries, our fourth trait, entails the ability to adopt the perspective of non-human subjectivities in order to understand how they conceive of themselves as the center of their own worlds. This ability, which is essential for empathy and is wired into many animals via mirror neurons, allows a person to feel as and to think as another. Anarchist Jean Zerzan relates anthropologist Van der Post's astonishment when studying the Bushmen in the Kalahari Desert, who, and I quote, seemed to know what it actually felt like to be an elephant, a lion, an antelope, a steenbuck, a lizard, a striped mouse, mantis, baobab tree, yellow-crested cobra, or starry-eyed amaryllis, to mention only a few of the brilliant multitudes through which they moved." End quote. Though such a capacity is available to all beings to different degrees, those persons who master this ability to cross ontological boundaries are called shamans. <laughs> and they are the active interlocutors in trans-specific dialogues. If Harvey's statement that we have always been animists infers that these indigenous animistic traits are also intrinsic to Western modernity, they have typically been reserved for modern white male human relations. Attributing such personhood only to themselves, such persons relegated humans of different color, culture, and gender, as well as all non-humans, to the status of thinghood. Similarly, rather than developing a relational ontology, modern humans have privileged essential intrinsic qualities as defining their personhood in individualistic terms over and against relational ones. And rather than understanding themselves as situated in a habitat and hence dependent upon an ecosystem, monotheistic reli religiosity has helped moderns to free themselves from the earth and seek meaning in a transcendent realm that pits spirit, mind, culture against body, matter, nature, and supernatural forces against natural ones. Finally, in modern Western culture, thinking as other has been relegated to childhood and to literature. Animism can thus help us understand the ontological mistake made by modernity in depriving non-human beings of personhood, ignoring the relational and situated nature of all persons, and undervaluing the importance of ontological boundary crossing. As anthropologist Philippe Descola explains in reference to indigenous animist tribes in South America, and I quote, the entities of which our universe is made have meaning and identity solely through the relations that constitute them as such, end quote. In a relational ontology, there's no way to differentiate between nature and culture, us and them, since there are no intrinsic identities outside of relationality. Such perspectivalism entails understanding that all beings are political entities, and thus that society and environment cannot be differentiated. Since each subject is in truth a multiplicity of perspectival subjective relations. Anthropologist Danowski and de Castro write, and I quote, I don't believe, no, uh, I don't have this quote up. Once the ancient nature culture orthogonal grid has been disposed of, a new multidimensional anthropological landscape may emerge in which stone adzes and quarks, cultivated plants and the genome map, hunting rituals and oil production may become intelligible as so many variations within a single set of relations encompassing humans as well as non-humans." When constituted in terms of relationality, Personhood is no longer the exclusive property of human beings, but is shared by all beings who enter into relations. All animals are persons, meaning they all share consciousness and soul. In the terms of anthropologist Eduardo Viveres de Castro, to be a person, quote, is to be conscious and self-conscious, to act intentionally with agency and to communicate intelligently and deliberately, end quote. Since all animals testify to personhood, what differs is embodiment. Since different shapes, sizes, limbs, and sensory organs embody soulhood in different ways. 
In an ironic twist to Anthropocene discourse, Viveros de Castro has taken this relationality a step further in his research on Amazonian tribes, when he claims that not only are all entities subjects, they are all human subjects. Since being human entails placing oneself at the center of the world and interpreting the world in terms of one's own bodily form and needs, all animals take themselves to be human. For the jaguar, as the Runa people put it, blood is manioc beer. It is thus not nature that all entities share, but rather humanity as the ability to interpret the world from a subjective point of view. For as de Castro puts it, and I quote, the basis of humans and non-humans is humanity, end quote. Such a shared humanity is possible because each living body is capable of crossing ontological boundaries and thinking itself into the being of another. It is this humanity as common ground that allows for a shared politics because in enunciating, in expressing its humanity, each human is able to think itself beyond the boundary of the unitary and enclosed self of the Western tradition. To refuse to see as another is thus a refutation of humanity, for it is precisely this ability that is humanity's defining trait. Viveros de Castro writes, and it's a difficult quote, uh, and I quote, typically in normal conditions, humans see humans as humans, animals as animals, and spirits, if they see them as spirits. However, animals, predators, and spirits see humans as animals, as prey, to the same extent that animals as prey see humans as spirit or as animals, predators. By the same token, animals and spirits see themselves as humans. They perceive themselves as or become anthropomorphic beings when they are in their own houses or villages and they experience their own habits and characteristics in the form of culture. They see their food as human food. Jaguars see blood as manioc beer. Vultures see the maggots in rotting meat as grilled fish. They see their bodily attributes, fur, feather, claws, beaks, as body decorations or cultural instruments. They see the social system as organized in the same way as human institutions are, with chiefs, shamans, ceremonies, exogamous moietis, etc. End quote. In such a worldview, humanity is both universal and subjective, since each species sees itself as human and other species cannot occupy the deictic position of the I. Yet each species knows that other species see themselves in a similar way, and thus all interrelations are political, or what Donowski and de Castro call a cosmopolitics. Danowski and de Castro call such indigenous peoples Terrans, from Terre, Earth, and they claim that no matter how numerous, they cite 370 million indigenous peoples across 70 nations, such Terrans will never replace the moderns because they will never form a majority and become, quote, responsible for a hegemonic ideology that could control peoples. That is not their role, end quote. Yet such peoples can launch what they call, citing philosophers Deleuze and Guattari, a resistance to the present and create a new earth, the world to come. Danowski and de Castro understand such a project of re-becoming indigenous as one of uncivilization, characterized by, and I quote, a technology of slowing down, a diseconomy no longer mesmerized by the hallucination of continuous growth, a cultural insurrection, if the expression may be pardoned, against the zombification of the citizen consumer, end quote. Rather than testifying to backwardness, such a re-becoming indigenous delineates the possible subsistence of the future. Only such a new people can create a new world from the ruins we will have left them. Part two, machinic animism. What might it mean then for us moderns to re-become indigenous and become uncivilized? Should we prepare darts for our blowguns and set up camp in a yurt or an earthship in abandoned industrial zones or join the Zona Défendre in France or the Earth Liberation Army or Extinction Rebellion elsewhere? That is one way. But Westerners are also re-becoming indigenous in more subtle ways. 
In his book, The Three Ecologies, philosopher and psychoanalyst Félix Guattari expresses concern over the lack of solidarity in our contemporary world and seeks to develop what he calls an ecosophy in order to create a transversal response capable of cultivating solidarity. In a passage written in 1989 that has come to sound almost eerie, he wrote, and I quote, now more than ever, Nature cannot be separated from culture. In order to comprehend the interactions between ecosystems, the mechanical sphere, and the social and individual universes of reference, we must learn to think transversally. Just as monstrous and mutant algae invade the lagoon of Venice, so our television screens are populated, saturated by degenerate images and statements. In the field of social ecology, men like Donald Trump are permitted to proliferate freely like another species of algae, taking over entire districts of New York and Atlantic City. How do we regain control of such an auto-destructive and potentially catastrophic situation? It is, on, it is not only species that are going extinct, but the words, phrases, and gestures of human solidarity. End quote. Because indigenous peoples never objectified the non-human world, preferring to attribute subjectivity universally to all entities, Guattari will ask us to, quote, pass through animist thought in order to develop a politics of nature in which subjectification, and thus the political, inheres in all matter. By replacing behavior with what he calls assemblage or agencement, and conscious subjectivity with pre-conscious subjectivation, the world is constantly opening itself up to being politically reconfigured by human and non-human subjects in a shared world. Attributing spirit to all beings, like a Mexican Quandero or a Bororo, could help us, Guattari claims, to develop the solidarity that is so sorely lacking in our Anthropocene age. Rather than intrinsic essences and exclusive rationality, subjectivity is fluid traveling from body to body by means of enunciation, or what Guattari calls a-signifying semiotics, whether gestural, aesthetic, or linguistic. It's only when subjectivity is imprisoned within a dominant human form in order to further the ends of economic competition and state power that communication ceases and subjects lose their singularity and can, and can no longer be transformed by their encounters with other subjects. We must ward off, Guattari tells us, and I quote, by every means possible, the entropic rise of a dominant subjectivity. Rather than remaining subject in perpetuity to the seductive efficiency of economic competition, we must reappropriate universes of value, end quote. Understood in this light, we might surmise that the Anthropocene represents precisely such an entropic dominant subjectivity caused by the rapid extermination of subjectification as the possibility of becoming other and communicating otherwise. If such a reconsideration of humanity is to be taken seriously today, it will require the development of a transversal ecosophy, which is able to take into account the ways natures and cultures coincide and communicate, the ways subjects become other to themselves through ontological trespassing. The value of subjectivation thus depends upon the ability of souls to reassemble and become other to themselves through their encounters with alterity. Guattari calls this ability machinic animism, an animism for the 21st century that would allow us to reassemble identities through potential encounters with myriad others. He writes, and I quote, I'm more inclined to propose a model of the unconscious akin to that of a Mexican Quandero or of a Bororo, starting with the idea that spirits populate things, landscapes, groups, and that there are all sorts of becomings of heseities everywhere, and thus a sort of objective subjectivity, if I may, which finds itself bundled together, broken apart, and shuffled at the whims of assemblages. The best unveiling among them would be found, obviously, in archaic thought." End quote. In this sense, machinic animism can help us to see the many ways that even today, and even in the West, we can reassemble our identities and cross ontological boundaries in order to see as another today. Though we live in a world where the influence of the capitalist utilitarian system has meant that students choose to study business instead of anthropology, engineering instead of philosophy, the humanistic disciplines 
are nonetheless built upon the capacity to see as other. In this sense, studying the humanities can foster ontological boundary crossings that are similar to animistic traditions. Historian Deepesh Chakrabarti has claimed that, and I quote, the questions of justice that follow from climate change science require us to possess an ability that only the humanities can foster, the ability to see something from another person's point of view. The ability, in other words, to imagine sympathetically the predicament of another person, end quote. For Chakrabarti, a solution to the Anthropocene depends upon the ability to enter other embodiments and see the world from their perspective, an ability cultivated in the humanities. We might indeed claim with novelist J.M. Coetzee that the humanities foster the inclusion of all other beings within humanity, just as indigenous animism does, and that such an inclusion is constitutive of what it means to be human. Though his book, The Lives of Animals, does not directly address the Anthropocene, Coetzee imagines a world where non-human forms of life have been genetically and biologically re-engineered to serve human ends, and where such a loss of other ways of being in the world incurs a loss of humanity, because the sympathetic imagination is dulled. To become human for Coetzee, we must be able to think ourselves into the being of another, to be more than one. Thinking, that is to say, is always thinking alterity, and thus always about sharing a world. And if we can think ourselves into the fictional characters of literature, Coetzee's protagonist, Elizabeth Costello, claims that we can think our way, and I quote, into the existence of a bat, or a chimpanzee, or an oyster, any being, with whom we share the substrate of life. There are people who have the capacity to imagine themselves as someone else. There are people who have no such capacity, and when the lack is extreme, we call them psychopaths. And there are people who have the capacity, but choose not to exercise it." End quote. Sympathetic imagination, rather than rational calculation, is required to see things from the point of view of a jaguar, a flying ant, or a forest. Such thinking as other will need to be explicitly cultivated in the world of the Anthropocene and in the solutions developed to address it if we hope to develop the solidarity required to address climate change. In a world where wild animals and indigenous communities are being pushed to extinction, we may be left with no alterity to imagine at all. This was indeed the dream of the Tyrell Corporation in the science fiction film Blade Runner. The Tyrell Corporation produced androids more human than human. The more human trait entailed precisely an utter lack of empathy, particularly empathy toward non-human forms of life. Philosopher James Stanisku expresses the stakes of this lack well, and I quote, These androids are completely interchangeable with humans except for one test. This test measures a person's empathy, particularly their empathy toward other animals. These replicants have managed the feat of cutting the human away from the animal. And this is the promise that the Tyrell Corporation is making with their slogan, more human than human, to produce a humanity that is disconnected from the finitude of humanity's very real animality." End quote. However ironic, the new age of the human might very well herald a world inhabited by a monospecies more human than human. Such an android, more, heralds a loss of true humanity. To respond to such a loss, we may need to cultivate a form of machinic animism that would privilege solidarity over technological manipulation and put into practice ontological boundary crossing alongside specialized learning. Perhaps such a revalorization, capable of incorporating the perspectives of other living sorry, of other thinking subjects into a shared cosmopolitics will be capable of providing us with a sympathetic imagination capable of making the Anthropocene era truly human. Thank you. Uh, thank you, both of you, for incredibly dense and rich and thoughtful presentations. Um, and actually, there were many sort of 
parallels between the arguments that you were it was both not presenting. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think that gives us lots of ground for discussion also between the two of you, which is really exciting. Um, so to, to kick things off, I guess I'll just uh, ask the speakers a few questions and we can open it up to the audience. How much time do we have? Half an hour? OK, good. Plenty of time, hopefully. So both the speakers this afternoon have offered us views on how we might prepare for an irreversible end of either Western modernity or capitalism's free ride. And the imperative that we must reconsider our relationship to nature. Um, and what I thought was interesting is that in both papers, the question of disenchantment came up. Um, so I'd ask, like to ask um, Federico the first question, uh, linking back to this question of disenchantment, because you left us with this gauntlet of the mystic as a figure. Um, or in your other work, you've talked about the magical. Yeah. Um, um, and I wondered if you could tell us what the mystic can do um, and what we might, how we might link that to the idea of re-enchantment. Yeah, well, um, I might disappoint maybe the expectation within the question, um, but I wouldn't define, for example, Western modernity as a state of disenchantment. I mean, of course, as a disclaimer, the trick of any theorist is to take any word and make it mean whatever they like. Okay, so I'm doing exactly that. But I would define disenchantment as um, the opposite, to a certain extent, of Western modernity. Why? Because if you um, consider the, the narrative creation of a world, it is in itself a charm. It is a spell that we cast upon an, uh, an incredibly um, powerful force, which is you know, reality in its rawest state. When uh, anthropologist Ernesto de Martino, for example, speaks about the work of the shaman, he describes um, his, uh, his work in particular, because it was the definition of a male shaman in that case, um, but his work as that of um, somehow bridling the nothingness, the absolute abyss of reality through their spells. The problem here, to a certain extent, is the excess of, uh, of enchantment. There's only enchantment. There's a world where there's only enchantment and nothing else. There was one of the, um, in, uh, makes you think, for example, of a strange creation myth from an Amerindian population, which says at the beginning there was nothing, only people, which is a wonderful way of saying it. Yeah? Um, and to a certain extent, the problem with Western modernity um, is, is that there is only enchantment. Now, the, the mystic is different in that case because the mystic is, inhabits the position of the object to a certain extent let's say, uh, reflects back on themselves the fantasy of an object, which is, of course, a fantasy, which is that thing which doesn't enchant nor is enchanted. That's why I was talking about the foreigner to a certain extent. Mm. The, the other understanding of enchantment, which, um, which relates to um, spiritual things, um, sometimes, not always, in the case of Adorno, maybe, um, relies of a... Of a let's say, prejudgment about the fact that there is a, such a thing as objectivity, which is related to uh, empirical, uh, empirically measurable things. And then, you know, there is this more spiritual realm that is more objectionable or opinable. Um, and then things that happen in that realm are more enchanted. Hmm? In my case, I, I don't make that particular separation. I make separation simply between, to say bluntly, ineffability and language. Things as they are before let's say they are in a world and things as they are in a world. And a world itself is a spell. Made of language. Yeah, yeah. essentially, yes. <laughs> um, would you like to, to add anything to that? Do you want to perhaps respond? Um, I like what you've just said. I was thinking more in a kind of classical Weberian context, which is the more you mechanize, the more you calculate, the less spontaneity. And that's what he meant by magic, was this kind of uh, not knowing, uh, mm -hmm. a kind of mystical unknowing, if you like, um, that is an attitude towards life one can have if one doesn't take all of life to be calculable algorithmically. Yeah. So I was thinking yeah. in a much more um, uh, restricted frame when I used the term. Um, Arian, you pointed out that the exploitation of nature is performed by a small elite and the consequences are suffered by everybody. Um, 
And that has it implies in it, and, and I think you know what we're dealing with right now with, uh, and I think both of you referred to this, this kind of violent end that we have to somehow be prepared for uh, and need, uh, need to build solidarities against or need to leave something behind after. And that made me think about animism in relation to violence. Sorry, and I wondered, to... in relation to violence, okay. in, in relation to the, you know, when we're thinking about the relationship between man and nature, um, and you spoke about how in the colonial paradigm, nature had to be subjugated, but equally, nature was often um, dangerous, right? And there was this antagonistic relationship with the beast or the monster yeah. that had to be fought yeah. and... and heroism and victory was kind of predicated on that. Yeah. So in some way, would the animistic mean having to be subjugated by nature or being open to that? You know, what would be the relationship of violence within that? Um, yeah, I'm not sure if um, the way you framed that was was uh, perhaps correct. I think that if we turn to animistic cultures, there's a question of reciprocity. So um, any animistic culture living in the Amazon hunts animals and kills them, and they're happy when they kill. <laughs> this right. is not a peaceful and meaning vegetarian vegans living in the Amazon, of course not. Right. Um, but they respect what they kill, and they expect what they kill to kill them too. Yeah. So if a jaguar kills, uh, kills you, that's also to be expected. If you kill the jaguar, lucky you. <laughs> <laughs> this is a reciprocal relation uh, and it, everything eats everything that's nature yeah it's not about non-violence it's about what what kind of violence the problem we have with the anthropocene is what uh, val plumbo and i agree with her calls remoteness a corporation over here destroys an ecosystem over there and doesn't even know what it's done because it doesn't feel the effect well uh, you know the scholars say let the owners of that corporation drink the water of the river they polluted make them drink it <laughs> That's what we need to do. <laughs> yeah, make them drink the water, that they, because the indigenous people living over here that have to drink the water have no power to stop them mm -hmm. from extricating all of the resources and the profit and bringing it over here. So the problem is remoteness, distance. Yeah? It's not violence, it's not the problem. Right. <laughs> Nature is violent. That's, not That's what problem. I was trying to understand. The, yeah. what, in, in that framework, so there's no question about trying to be, oh, peace, uh, you know, we're hippies, peace on earth, love, love, love. No, right. nature is violent. Let's get back to reciprocal relations with nature and overcome this remoteness, this distance, absolute distance from the goal, which is profit-making over here, and what actually happens over here. Um, you also mentioned um, this idea of being more human than human, right? Mm. And that reminded me of Ray Kurzweil's ideas around um, the, the superhuman or artificial intelligence. Um, and I just thought since we are in the digital earth forum, and it was interesting that in both your papers, there's this idea of getting beyond technology somehow. Um, and I just, you know, how do, how do we think through that in terms of solidarity? I think um, neither. I, I, Either if you I'm can I'm not going to go beyond technology. <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> neither of us are wanting to go beyond technology. No. No. Uh, I, there is no going beyond technology. We are technological beings from day one. Yeah, we yeah. are constituted through technology. Technology enlarges our humanity. Yeah, so there is no question of moving beyond technology. Or the question of Ray Kurzweil and transhumanists is simply looking at what they're saying, and all they're saying is medieval. <laughs> That's what they're saying. They're saying, okay. We can't really believe in the medieval God system anymore. We can't reject this earth anymore in the terms of the medieval system. So let's just change the terms. We live in a technological world. God becomes, uh, you know, some super human robot that we can become, or the singularity in the case of Ray Kurzweil, right? That's our future. It's not of this earth. So they're still believing in an afterlife. They've just switched the afterlife to some technological realm when the human being has been so transformed that all of the problems and what they see as a problem is mortality, right? The fact that we have to die, that's untenable for Ray Kurzweil. Uh, the fact that we age is untenable for Ray Kurzweil. So it's just a Christian monotheistic religious story and you've just shifted God to the singularity when we don't have to die anymore and when we don't have to age anymore. I think it's actually silly. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I mean, also to maybe put together a number of things that come yeah. from the last two questions and also to continue in part what Ariane was, was, was talking about. Uh, first of all, I like the idea definitely of having people that pollute the water to drink it. I would extend it to architects that build council flats <laughs> and they have to <laughs> live in them because yeah. South East London has been devastated by people that don't live in there. Anyway. Yes. But, um, but um, in, in the, in the, also in reference to violence and, um, and to what you were talking about, um, I think I mean, first of all, I'm definitely not against technology as such. Uh, I'm not a fan of Jean Simon Don, but I think he has a point when he says that technology is within, mm -hmm. uh, within our form of individuation. That is a form in which we define ourselves through a relation with the others. And technology is not the, the the point. When I was writing, for example, in reference to technology, which I did only once, and I don't think I'll do again, but um, I was talking about technique, not about technology, which is the essence of technology. So it's a different thing. I'm not a primitivist in that sense. But um, I see uh, in um, certain aspects, for example, of the contemporary understanding of um, technology, of violence, and of time as problematic. First of all, the notion of contemporaneity, which is a, a, like an absolute denial of <laughs> an absolute denial of the temporality of, of metaphysical narrations. It's a bit like in my st story, which, which I started, just me sleeping through the afternoons. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> the other one is, is, is the understanding of violence which is also, once again, like completely dissociated. On the one hand, the absolute brutality of a violence that you don't see, and on the other, the squirmishness towards death, especially your own, to the point that, for example, if you read newspapers often, somebody is a hero simply because they died. Oops. Somebody is defined a hero simply because they died. They died like yeah. a hero. <laughs> no, which is also, it has nothing to do with the term in itself. In that case, I, I would see more the, the reinserting, to, uh, say, the, the tragic aspect within. And the tragic aspect is, is in part also present within the, um, within the Amazonian, or I, I refer in particular to the Amazonian narration because that's what you were referring to. So uh, the idea that to a certain extent, um, decay, becoming, and violence are unavoidable, and yet that, uh, that if you face them and you relate to them in a certain way, you can somehow um, tame the most extreme effects. Okay, because the problem here is not really, um, the problem of the contemporary age is not so much just the distribution of, of death, but the, um, not the presence of death, but the distribution of death and the way in which it is intensified. Um, Reinserting the tragic as aspect, I think, means um, accepting that as, a, as, an, as an implacable fact, and at the same time, being able to relate with it because you have an understanding that there is at least a, a certain part of you and a certain part of your counterpart that is immune to it. You don't believe in violence to a certain extent. You don't believe that it has the ability to destroy everything. Why? Because you see a multidimensional world. And in a multidimensional world, you would need an absolute catastrophe to destroy everything. But even the absolute catastrophe doesn't work. In this imagination, you don't have the apocalypse, but you have the apocatastasis, the reintegration. Right. So that's just to kind of contextualize how I think about violence in that sense. Um, I'm going to open it up to the floor. Lots of questions, that's good. Um, we'll start here and then move to the other side. So the lady in the white t-shirt. <coughs> Hello. Uh, thank you to both. Uh, really great, uh, great presentations. Um, I think for me personally, what I what I started thinking of uh, with this whole set of talks, and also starting with the, the ones that the two of you have uh, have opened, um, I'm thinking of the digital world at this intersection of Bruno Latour's ideas in facing Gaia, uh, which is a term he takes from uh, James Lovelock. He tries to salvage from the Lovelock disbelievers. And then Lovelock's uh, last book on the Nova scene, right? This whole idea of uh, creating hyper-intelligence. Um, and the question I have, the question I, uh, that's on my mind is um, something that I don't know if we touched on very much in these talks, which is uh, this future as a post-human future, right? Well, Federico especially uh, spoke about how past civilizations uh, exist and we're just another civilization. But my question is, why have moderns, first off, how much do we have in common with how much we think about the future with these past civilizations, right? Uh, and then the question is, 
are we thinking about the future in a different way? Because we've imagined this catastrophic, catastrophic future where the worst thing possible is a world without us, right? The worst thing possible is a planet where we do not exist anymore. And then in that sense, I want to open this to both of you. Isn't then the digital a potential pharmacon? In the sense that, right, it reifies this obsession we have with our humanity, with our individuality, with our hyper existence. And then isn't that the, the very thing that is basically feeding the fact that we're going to... Um, we're going to end human life, in a sense. I don't know if this was too complicated, but like... <laughs> That's for you. <laughs> I'm giving it to you. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, okay, yes. Uh, I think maybe... Um, yeah, there's many strands to the question, so maybe I'll try to touch maybe upon one or two very briefly. Um, the first thing is, is about the imagination of the future. Uh, of course, uh, let's say, uh, content-wise, uh, the, the imagination of the future is different. They usually have in common that it doesn't end. Uh, the, idea that if, if, the idea of the timeline is a typical thing. Everybody thinks they're living in a timeline, but they're not. They're living in a time segment. So in, to, to that extent, structurally, there is an absolute similarity there. Um, the, then the, the narrations themselves are different. But in the same way that we call books any book, regardless of what's inside, I think we can, we can call imagination of the future any imagination of the future, regardless of the specificities. In that sense, the imagination of the future of the Mycenaeans not too dissimilar from ours. Uh, I was recently uh, rereading, for example, Hesiod's um, re uh, retelling of the ages of the world and of the decay and comparing it with contemporary imaginations and I was finding an astonishing similarity um, uh, between them. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't believe ourselves to be exceptional to the extent that things that relate to other old civilizations uh, don't apply. Um, the other part of the question was about, uh, yes, was about the, the pharmacon, the digital pharmacon. I'm not sure. And I was trying to hint at it in the, in the previous uh, um, brief answer. <clears throat> Why? Because the pharmacon is, as I said, it tries to be an antidote to both order and disorder, basically to two fears. And it has to include that tragic dimension once again. That tragic dimension simply means that you, you are capable of negotiating between two fears or between any fear if you have a, a feeling that there is at least a part within that you cannot lose, at least a part that, you, that somehow is there, okay? A belief of something. In that case, the fears have to do with the construction of the world. And that something is something outside of the world. That's why I was talking about the mystic to put in the mix. The mystic is a tragic figure, of course. Like the prophet is a tragic figure. If you think, for example, of Moses, he's, he's, a, he's a person with a stutter. You know, like the, this, the prophet is always tragic. And machines don't have that. Machines don't have unworldliness. Machines are worlds that are perfect, perfectly closed onto themselves. That's why, for example, um, if artificial intelligence will always be able to predict futures, in a sense, within their own timelines, but will never be able to predict anything outside of it. <laughs> which makes them particularly useless today. Because what we, the question is not understanding what is the future, but what's after the future. So I don't see the digital as a pharmacon at all. M it might be a tool. <laughs> yeah. Question there and then there. Okay. Thank you both. Um, my question is just, once, I want to go back to the point of animism and this idea that, uh, and maybe just suggest, uh, sort of thinking about the suggestion that uh, we should look at ourselves as indigenous uh, academic. In a way, it ends up being uh, replacing a one hierarchy for another, uh, because for them, uh, a lot of these animals have uh, gender and special social roles. So in the end, uh, um, I, I think if we have this tendency of, think of thinking of animism as a way of excusing ourselves for destroying the planet and thinking, oh, maybe we should uh, all think like plants. But it's, so it's easy to think of myself as the dinner of the jaguar, as long as there are no jaguars around. Um, so, so I just want to understand to, to what extent this just your take, your indigenous take of animism. That's really my question. It calls for reciprocity. Yeah. And reciprocity means when the jaguar is there, 
Yeah, and you're right. And here we are, you know, uh, in a world without jaguars, and quite possibly you know, there will be a world without jaguars. Yeah. So it's easy to say, "Oh, long live jaguars," when you're not near a jaguar, right? But I do think that. <clears throat> Um, indigenous peoples did have reciprocal communication with, they still do have reciprocal communication with whatever beings happen to live in their, uh, in their world with them. They are not uh, monospecies, none of them live alone in a world. We are the only, uh, and we live with, you know, these transformed animals that we call domestic animals that we treat as if they were human, yeah, and we give them little coats and they trot around with us in the street. Um, so... <clears throat> Uh, either we transform wild animals to become stupid, which is what we did with sheep and cows, so that we can eat them and treat them as objects, and then we say, oh, look how dumb they are. Uh, we, we are right to eat them and uh, torture them, uh, which is how we kill them to make, turn them into meat, right? Or we have these pets, and the pets become these kind of very strange pseudo-humans, and we give them all the rights in the world. We treat them better than human beings often. Um, and I think that indigenous peoples uh, allow for this necessary category, which is the wild animal. That means the wild animal has its own volitions and its own uh, cultures, and those need to be respected and taken into account. We need to share the world with others, others, other human others, and that is something Western modernity has tried to get rid of as much as possible. You have to be like me or don't be. Yeah, so I'm going to colonize you and make you like me uh, or kill you, which is what it did with most indigenous populations. Um, uh, so there's, my point was that the respect for other alterities and other cultures and reciprocal relations is the same between humans as it is between humans and non-humans. We need to, if <laughs> we want to live on into some sort of after the future, uh, either perhaps we will kill ourselves off or leave only the psychopaths, uh, or we will perhaps be able to slowly now adopt a new ideology, uh, which is could be some machinic animism in which we give reciprocal relations to other beings. In other words, we give them their own volitions, we give them their own cultures, and we allow them to live on the earth with us. Um, and that requires big changes. And that includes the other human beings that we've decided are somehow inferior, <laughs> right? Uh, less human, yeah? And that includes women, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's the same story for me. I'm not sure. I hope that's an answer to your question. I'm, I, I don't call for peace. That's not my claim. <laughs> I never said anything about peace. <laughs> okay. Um, is it? Oh, yeah, it is. Okay, thank you very much for your presentations. Um, I was, I think this is more of a comment than a question. Maybe it's a rhetorical question. Something about what Latour says really bothers me at my core. Um, and I think comments like the future is indigenous or things like that. Um, and I think that's because I associate knowledge and power as somehow intertwined. And I think the celebration of the indigenous is doing it just from like a knowledge sphere without recognizing, um, without anything happening on the power sphere. And I'm wondering like, how do we go beyond that or address that? And then also the other thing is how do we, um, living in a knowledge society today and seeing how some of these knowledge systems are being capitalized on, make sure that we don't kind of repeat certain cycles of capitalism, um, but just in new forms. I don't know if you know, understand what I mean by that. So. Sure. Um, it's a difficult question because <clears throat> I think often as academics, we feel useless, right? I can repeat again and again, okay, we have to overcome this, <laughs> you know, the nature culture divide. And in my view, if we were to do so, that would, would or could change power relations because they're built upon ideological presuppositions. That's what we've both been discussing. Uh, ideologies matter. Uh, they're not separate from power. And therefore, as an academic and as a philosopher, I speak from that end in the hopes that a change of ideology can change power relations. And I do believe it can. <laughs> yeah, I do believe they are, they are Foucault, yeah, they are connected. <laughs> uh, so as an academic, what does that mean? It means we change also our, our words, yeah? We change the words that we use to describe the world. We have to take into account all of these divisions which are intrinsically embedded into our, we're all speaking English. How many of, uh, of us are actually English in this room, yeah? That's a limitation. Uh, we have to take into account these limitations and we have to be very, very careful about the words we use to describe the world. 
Um, and I'm, I mean, my hope as a philosopher is that shifting the way we use language, shifting the way we enact power in our little tiny lives, and shifting the ideologies that we depend upon can change these power relations. Mm. It doesn't mean we shouldn't also be activists. Yes, we should also do that. Um, I think it's an interesting point, definitely, and it's a difficult one. Um, it's, a, it's a dangerous also, a, diff a dangerous point, uh, in the sense that um, sometimes there seems to be that this dichotomy between um, speaking illegitimately or vanishing entirely. The problem is sometimes also, it's not maybe necessarily my case, because I usually kind of, when I report words, they're never from anybody living, usually. <laughs> it's like part of my poetics, if you like. But, um, but in the case, for example, speaking on behalf of the indigenous, well, but it's difficult. I don't, I, I'm not sure that knowledge is power to a certain extent. I'm sure that power is knowledge. Uh, or power sets the parameters of knowledge, of, of worlding to a certain extent, and, and the acquisition of information which reinforce these parameters constitutes maybe power itself. Now, I think sometimes appropriating is not a bad idea. There are many different ways of appropriating. For example, where I come from, Sicily, we call it syncretism, which is a very different idea from what appropriation is an Anglo-American problem, like a lot of problems, like the apocalypse. Those problems are Anglo-American problems for people who never lost a war. Mm? If, you have, if you come from a people that has lost more than one word, you understand that appropriating is important. Apocalypses are fine. And a lot of these things are resolvable. Now, they are resolvable, but I think also by including the perspective of, um, of somebody who's been defeated, by somehow saying, yes, you have been defeated, but defeat is not all, okay? There is, uh, there is a survival outside of history. You, we're not gonna change the fact that you are historically defeated because it's not within our power, also because we are historically defeated too, but we are creating some space in which it's possible to survive the catastrophes of history. Syncretism is one of them. And this way of doing anthropology, which also Eduardo Iveros de Castro, we, completely coincidentally, we have both mentioned a lot today, um, defines this in his project of re-changing anthropology to include the gaze of the, of the indigenous person. Yes, it might have some political problems, but I think that's an Anglo-American problem. <laughs> I, I forgot the beginning of your book. And um, I just want to add to what he said. I think that the problem with Latour's use of indigenous, and I agree, we're constantly borrowing. There's no problem with borrowing as long as you're respecting what you're borrowing. Yeah, I think the problem many indigenous people have with Latour's use of indigenous uh, ideas is his political usage is contrary to uh, the political activism of these indigenous peoples themselves, because Latour is politically uh, extraordinarily bourgeois. Uh, and he actually stands up for a kind of uh, very liberal form of democracy that has uh, a constitutional democracy that doesn't allow for representation from the bottom up. That's the problem indigenous scholars have with Latour. Yeah? So I think as long as we can clarify, um, I don't see, I agree with uh, what was just said about, of course, we're, what is culture? It's always intersections of myriad cultures, and there's no problem in a machinic animism for the 21st century that is inspired by indigenous population, as long as we're respecting indigenous population, which is what I'm trying to do. And, um, uh, and then you enter into dialogue with indigenous scholars and indigenous uh, anthropologists, sub-indigenous cultures, and you try to be as respectful as possible. So I don't see that as a problem. I think on the contrary, that's a solution because of the, what we mean by globalization is uh, really American culture being forced on everyone else. That's all globalization means to me. And I think that in order to contrast that in terms of its um, hegemonic, uh, capitalistic overtones, well, then we need to borrow from everywhere we can find to say, well, there's other stories we can tell. <laughs> yeah, And many of these stories can provide perhaps futures uh, after the end of this story that we've been telling ourselves that we call modernity, yeah? So um, I think the point is to move beyond a hegemonic discourse, which is the only one, which is what I hear every day at the university. It's, you know, nature is blood in tooth and claw. We are competitive individualistic uh, people. Therefore, capitalism is the only system we can do, right? That is taken for granted today across the world because of one hegemonic story.
So the point is we need to find other stories and put them into play against each other so that we can get a multiplicity rather than a monologic discourse. There's one question. Um, oh, that's loud. I am very uncomfortable with the thread that seems to fetishize indigeneity and the idea that this return to purity um, discourse that indigeneity can somehow offer a path to a return to purity. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a non-violent, pure past. I do get that, that you're not necessarily saying that indigeneity offers a peace, a pacific sort of discourse, but the idea of the way in which this, um, the setup is basically that there is Western modernity and indigeneity in its myriad forms is set up as in opposition to that. So it is other, it is the other. And I wanna push back on that by asking, well, if we have defined Western um, political construction, cultural production, et cetera, et cetera, um, to, to flip, to invert the gaze, as it were, um, and to ask, well, what is it that creates this, I don't know how to define this, but I, I want, what does it look like from the other side is what I'm really pushing back on. Because we have in setting up um, the indigenous as basically the place that will save the West, the indigenous will save the West from itself, then why? I, sorry, I'm really struggling to articulate the question because I'm looking at, we're all indigenous somewhere. And the idea that, first of all, that indigenous cultures are frozen in time, and this is what has always made me very uncomfortable about anthropology, that we're frozen in time, frozen in politics, frozen in and not having to struggle with similar cultural, social questions, albeit not articulated in the same language, we talked about language, um, but in the same lines. And then at the same time, um, the power dynamic that comes from projecting our own anxieties onto another society as if to say, well, we've, can I swear? Sorry, we've messed up. Yes, we've messed up. Please save us. That is a dangerous dynamic, I think, that um, establishes a different type of exploitation. Um, when we burn sage to purify our cultures, our energy and to cleanse the energy, that is a form of violence. You talk about appropriation. That's a form of violence against Native American populations because it is taking an element of identity out of its context making it an abstraction and um, and it does both psychic violence to those communities, but it also does physical violence because now sage has become this rare thing um, and it's, it's dwindled in the natural environment. Like there's a form of this salvation doctrine that is, we be, the, the indigenous then becomes something to be consumed. And so what I would love to interrogate is this idea, okay, well, let's flip the gaze. Let's look at what it looks like from the other side. And, and I don't know exactly how to define that um, in terms of what needs to happen of a, of a cultural program or a structural program or whatever, but I, I do think that there's a problem underlying here that needs to be interrogated further, which is why, does, why is indigeneity presumed to be static and healing and pure and you know, um, and then, uh, yeah, sorry. I should have probably articulated that question better, but I, I just wanted to articulate that discomfort. I think this has become a bigger and bigger problem recently. Yeah? It comes up all the time. But the words you've used are not words I used. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So you're imposing upon... Uh, there's no purity. I'm not interested in purity. <laughs> there's no non-violence. I'm not interested in non-violence. Yeah? I'm interested um, in forms of communication that could allow us to live on the earth uh, in ways that could not destroy the earth because that's what we're doing right now and other cultures do have in my view better forms of communication than modern western communication so i'm just 
uh, looking at other cultures, machinic animism uh, is taking, borrowing, yes, things from uh, animism because it has reciprocal communication schemes which are ideologically embedded in its culture. Uh, I think we could learn something um, and make improvements on the harm we're doing to the earth, looking at those ideas. Um, I don't only look at indigenous. In my book, I also look at Jain, Jainism, for example. It has an extraordinarily strict ethic, which I think is, again, useful. Um, uh, I look at certain uh, Asian forms of Buddhism as well uh, to see if that ideology could be useful. So what's the problem, you're asking me, of borrowing from other cultures? Cultures have always borrowed from each other. You said to you that the sage is somehow violent. I think when I hear this, and it's becoming something that I hear more and more frequently, uh, I would have to say I disagree. I mean, it's like saying, well, you can't do yoga because you have blonde hair and, and, and white skin. How dare you do yoga? Yoga's Indian, <laughs> right? Um, well, yes, yoga is Indian. Yoga comes from India, but it's something that people do across the globe. Yes, they do it in commodified ways that take away the value of yoga. You're right. But who do you blame for that? You don't blame the, you know, are the Indians angry at Americans because they practice yoga wrong? No, they don't give a damn, right? So if you want to borrow from us and use it wrongly and integrate it into your culture such that it loses its value, that's your problem, right? That doesn't take away from the value of yoga in India. Um, and in the same way, if sage becomes some, you know, chic thing that you buy for 50 euros so that you can clean your space, um, why should that upset an indigenous person? Unless, of course, there is some problem with the actual sage, that they're buying up all of the sage so indigenous people don't have any sage anymore. And then we can get into an economic discussion, then we, get, we look at capitalism again, and that's something we could study. But I don't think borrowing in and of itself is wrong. On the contrary, cultures have always borrowed from each other. Do you have something to add? It's the power relation mm. problem, that there is an imbalance to begin with. Of course. Right? Yeah. So, but with part, the of trying, point, ooh, problem. <laughs> part of trying to work toward overcoming that power imbalance mm. is so, learning from, <clears throat> is what you're saying. I'm hoping, partially. I mean, provided that, uh, sorry, I just want to chip in a second because but to be honest, I never use so-called indigenous knowledge in uh, in my work. I usually look at different sources, mainly from the Mediterranean basin and a bit from India. But nonetheless, um, if I did, which I, which I haven't done, but in case I did, um, I have a problem sometimes with also with the misnomer of indigenous. What does that even mean exactly? There was a, there was a big problem in ancient Greece, for example, in which the in which the aristocrats of Athens were proud that they were sprung out of the soil itself. And Diogenes the Cynic used to say, it's exactly like weeds or insects. This, this problem here is, who is that really indigenous? Nobody is indigenous. Who is really native? Nobody. Nobody is native from a place where, you know, see what I mean? We, differently from plants, we don't have that particular thing. It isn't an ideological construction. In itself, the construction is dangerous. The reason why I think it would be, it's important not to eradicate um, or to protect or to avoid devastation on certain areas of the world and the people that live in that is not because they are indigenous as if they were bearers of something unique in itself, but because they are people. Simply that. There is no such thing as indigenous, there is no such thing as native, there is no such thing, there is only foreigners. In the world there is only foreigners. Everybody is a foreigner. I mean, this is the point. I use often the example of Sicily, because we eradicated natives about 4,000 years ago. <laughs> now, a little bit less, two th almost 3,000 years ago, when the Phoenicians first arrived, the only natives we had, we lost. And thank God. Okay, so we've, we've been foreigners <laughs> ever since. You know, nobody can claim to be Sicilian. Nobody can claim a pure relationship with the earth. Nobody can claim to be the salt of the earth to a certain extent. You see what I mean? The construction itself of the native is a dangerous construction because it creates a space of purity which also creates a strange geography of power and makes also, uh, I think, uh, many people blind to the fact that we are talking just about people. Human and non-human people at times, but also human people, specifically in the case of indigenous populations. And this is the problem, simply that massacring and destroying people and their worlds is, is no. <laughs> okay, that's it. Because there's no such thing as a native. Um, white Americans that call themselves natives of, like, uh, white English people that call themselves native where, where, I, where I live in the UK, we, we take a lot of that bullshit. All, this, all these natives, these blonde natives from Scandinavia, actually. <laughs> and, you know, like this, this return to the, an absolute identity of rootedness is evil in itself because that's what justifies all the rest. 
Do we have uh, time? One more question. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, for me today, um, to die well uh, is a main uh, lesson for Congolese people and for um, many systems. Uh, because, for instance, in Congo, uh, um, every system is uh, are down, uh, but everyone uh, don't like uh, accept to die, and and then to restart uh, a new axiomatic uh, uh, segment. Uh, because you thought that uh, we are living in uh, uh, following axiomatic uh, uh, segment. My question is. Uh, you thought uh, that the technology is the problem, technology or technique, I, I don't know, in evolution. But for me, the impact of technology is the same from the beginning of every segment uh, to the, uh, the end. But which kind of technology uh, do you speak about? Uh, because it's, it's the problem. Yeah, m maybe I, I maybe I express myself uh, un unclearly because unclear I think maybe there's a misunderstanding in the sense that I I don't think that technology is in itself the problem. There is a problem in the sense of how to transmit cultural material, um, let's say, to a long distance, temporally and culturally. The technologies we have at hand at the moment don't seem to be capable of doing that. Uh, for especially the digital technologies, but not only. The, the digital technologies are the main example because they will just vanish, you know, in the blink of an eye. What would be an example of embodied knowledge in that case? Like of something that matches. Uh, the examples that I gave were, um, for example, relative to, yeah, the survival of particular practices in ancient. I've, I've given examples, as usual, from a specific area of the world. Um, this is just one example and one particular area in which I focus on, which is the eastern, southeastern part of the Mediterranean Sea. You can find very similar examples everywhere. Um, what well, another, actually, a good example is talking of that the society that produced the Vedas. The society that produced the Vedas is a society of which we don't have any material culture left. Nothing, yeah. completely. A bit like people that were in Europe in the sixth century, seventh century. We only have the Vedas. Yeah. Not just as a text, but the Vedas as a, re as a, co as a complex of, um, of ritualistic acts. In that specific case, it is interesting, but it is highly codified, was codified as such a bit later. But the interesting, the interesting part of ritualistic acts is that they are embodied practices. They usually have to do with liminal experiences. For example, the experience of how you um, deal with death, absence, uh, power, and so on and so forth. In that particular case, we, we witness something very strange in which um, once again, the supposedly natives, of course, they were natives of that because they came from very, but they called themselves the natives, were invaded by the Aryans coming from the north and, and eradicated entirely. And what remained of the, of the natives was the culture that the Aryans appropriated from them, which is what we call Hinduism. <laughs> okay? Which is what we call Hinduism and which today Hindu nationalists call as their own thing. Well, of course, it's not their own because it doesn't come from them. Anyway. Um, so that's a good example of how, of what kind of technologies, what kind of embodiments work. Thank you both for an extremely lively debate. Thank you to the audience. <laughs>